Mr. WrestleMania is a title that belongs to Shawn Michaels, and with good reason. He's one of the most decorated and complete performers of all time. Plus, over the course of two different stints, showed up and showed out at WrestleMania on a yearly basis. But in the modern era, I think the tag of Mr. WrestleMania belongs to Seth Rollins. Everyone always talks about how Shawn Michaels had a spectacular WrestleMania resume, and that is true. That's not just old head speak that continues to be forced down our throats. That man truly dominated this event bar none. The reason his resume gets so much praise comes down to the fact that he stole the show wherever he was. 17 times he competed at WrestleMania, and with each performance he showed his range as a performer and expanded his resume. A resume that goes much beyond just main event matches. Inside that catalog were some of the most well-constructed stories that led us to the showcase of the Immortals. Whether it was the quest for self-fulfillment against The Undertaker, or he was putting Ric Flair down as the friend that just loved him too much to see what he became, and I haven't even touched on the show stealing matches yet. Against The Undertaker twice, against Kurt Angle, the triple threat at WrestleMania 20, against Razor Ramon at WrestleMania 10, Cena at 23, Bret Hart, Chris Jericho, it's really pick your poison. But aside from the matches, what's so important is everything else in between. Having captivating stories and making your mark on the event. And it's one thing to be forced upon the fans at WrestleMania, we've seen that before. But it's another when people can look back at what you did and just go, man that guy really put together this resume in a versatile way. Facing different opponents, not always being the main event, telling different stories that didn't just attach themselves to a world title, not having the same match over and over, and most importantly, making the most of your time, making the most of where you were on the card. That's HBK, he's Mr. WrestleMania, there's not really that much doubt about it. But it's been a long time since he's competed at that show. And since he's been off doing whatever having the craziest explore page known to man, Seth Rollins has been creating a resume of his own and has been having a yearly impact on WrestleMania. And the resume truly does speak for itself. He's been dominating this event, win or loss, and a lot of the things in his tenure mirror Shawn Michaels. Yeah, I get it. Comparison is the thief of joy. We're wrestling fans. We hate being happy. The first two matches Rollins competed in at the show were at WrestleMania 29 and 30, and those were just really tag matches with the end goal of getting the Shield more exposure. In his first year as a single star was when he made an epic splash. When a lot of people look at this logo, they immediately think heist of the century, a night where Seth Rollins stole WrestleMania. Earlier in the night, he took on Randy Orton in a strong match that's most remembered for this highlight reel RKO. And if this was the night, it'd be pretty underwhelming for him, but we all know that wasn't the case. That 0-1 record quickly became 1-1 as he ran down the ramp, cashed in his money in the bank in the main event, and won the WWE Championship. This cemented a moment for the ages, a moment that's so important to WWE and will be talked about forever. Landmark, big time, important, use whatever adjective you want for it. It's a moment that's going to follow Seth Rollins to the Hall of Fame. So his WrestleMania solo career kicked off with a major bang. It should also be said that up until this point he's still yet to have a match that can be classified as a stinker, that you can just classify as garbage. The next year he missed because of a knee injury, that knee injury changed a lot in his career because the way in which he performed became more safe. Pre-knee injury Rollins had a different fluidity to him, his matches were structured in a different way, he was more explosive with his offense and he was taking more risks. Judging by the rumors that were circulating, the company wanted to do either Rollins vs Reigns for the title which had been building before Rollins got injured, or the Shield triple threat. Instead, the main event was Triple H vs Roman Reigns, the same person he faced the next year. Here it was Student vs Sensei, where the WWE told a strong story of the bond that these two had since the beginning, how Triple H helped Rollins, how he had always been a father figure to him, been there every step of the way in his journey, led him to the promised land before eventually turning on him. The direction that was taken from a creative standpoint was that Triple H was avoiding Rollins at every point, with him then becoming obsessed with revenge and nothing else. So much so that he rocked up at NXT TakeOver San Antonio to call him out. This version of his character was a breath of fresh air because it was the first time in his singles run since the Shield split that he was a full blown babyface. And that's an important part when looking at his resume, is how much did you evolve as a performer? First we had Shield Rollins 
Rollins, then Authority Rollins, then King Slayer slash B Slayer slash Burn It Down Rollins from 2017 to 2019, then came the Messiah and now the Visionary. Like I said, you can't just be a one trick pony. The match against Triple H was booked as an unsanctioned match because they wanted to tell the story of the injured knee. That was exactly what happened as the knee got worked for the entirety of the contest. The match was slow, the crowd wasn't really into it, except for the finish when Stephanie got knocked into a table by Triple H. Pedigree 1, 2, 3, the student beating the master with his own move. Stanza 4 came at WrestleMania 34, a triple threat match for the Intercontinental Championship. The Miz, Finn Balor, and Seth Rollins. And this was an epic opening match. Pedal to the metal, the crowd was into it. These three really took advantage of being the first match, having an amped crowd, and going all in. Why this match is good is because of the competitiveness in it. Everyone's going a million miles per hour. It's fast paced. It's an opener that was elevated thanks to the performance of Seth Rollins. He was flying around, hitting splashes, doing his thing, and became the intercontinental champion for the first time in his career. And again, the word versatility comes up. I started off by talking about how Shawn Michaels has some amazing matches. Storyline wise, I don't think Rollins is in that same company, but from a match standpoint, it's always there. The next year, WrestleMania goes extra long, started with Brock Lesnar and Seth Rollins for the Heinz Championship, with the focus being to do a quicker, adrenaline-packed title change that would be lifted up because of a pre-match assault. A pre-match assault which was done to paint Rollins as the underdog. This went two and a half minutes, with the focus being to display Rollins as the underdog who was willing to do anything to win. And that's exactly what happened after he hit a low blow followed by three curb stomps to win the Universal title for the first time in his career. A feel good title change to kick things off and since Rollins had won the Royal Rumble, maybe the expectation was this goes 10 to 15 minutes where Rollins eventually wins but this made all the sense in the world because the story was that Rollins was fighting for the fans, to give them a champion they could be proud of, to give them a champion that would show up. That's why the match made sense was even though he was a face, he still hit a low blow for the win because the end goal was to keep his promise to the fans. This was not a 5 star match, probably not even a 3 star match, but it's something that served a purpose for what it was. What's insane is Rollins up until this point had won at every Wrestlemania he'd been in. Despite losing at 31, they still had him win in the main event and now he had put up 4 consecutive wins. After this, he went on a losing streak for the next three shows, now playing into the fact that he had all this history behind him, and they used that as part of their storylines. Messiah Rollins marched into WrestleMania 36 to take on Kevin Owens, and once again, it was a hit. Leading in, he cut a scathing promo inside an empty WWE Performance Center, which was one of the most memorable things to happen in a time frame that wasn't too memorable. I'm looking at you, Retribution, and Eye for an Eye match, and Raw Underground. Anyways, Rollins talked about how nothing would exist without him, especially the building, that the stars from that time frame wouldn't be around if it wasn't for him, that he didn't need the performance center, capping things off by saying WrestleMania was never his worst day and that he becomes a god at that event. He and Kevin Owens had essentially two matches, the first ended in a DQ, then the match was restarted as no DQ, and it was simply just a meeting of two great in-ring performers. It's hampered by the fact that it's a pandemic match, they don't have the best replay value to them, but when you put that aside, it's a really competitive match. At WrestleMania 37 the following year, it was much the same. This time the job was for Rollins to help Cesaro and further make him into an underdog. The theme was that he had never had a singles match at WrestleMania, never could win the big one against the guy who had his best nights at the event. And again, it's one of these matches that sneaks under the radar, but important to remember my point at the top, slotting into roles that build your resume. And the past two were that. He ended up losing, but the effort and chemistry between these two was still top tier. The match was filled with some cool reversals, big power moves, and what you'd expect in a match between these two. Not exactly a big time enticing match, no disrespect to Cesaro, but not every year needs to be this insane storyline which is balls to the wall and people are getting ran over with cars and wild stuff is happening. However, the next year was a landmark story. A story you could probably say is Rollins' best. He essentially had to build this up on his own, and you guys know exactly what happened and how it happened. Rollins couldn't find his way onto WrestleMania, and he lost, and he lost, and he lost. 
before eventually making it last minute thanks to a mystery opponent storyline. In this, he made going to WrestleMania feel like the end all be all. When we got to Dallas, it was an epic between him and a returning Cody Rhodes. To have Rollins be the guy who Cody's return match came against is huge. This was a different way to tell a story, and it comes back to that diversity I mentioned before, making a trip to WrestleMania feel like life or death, and not only that, but putting on an outstanding match. Had it been a lesser performer, maybe the match doesn't go the same way, maybe it's not as good. Cody coming back was a huge moment, but let's not forget how important it was for these two to also deliver from an in-ring standpoint. Seth being a vehicle to reintroduce Cody to the WWE audience, to help introduce him to people who maybe didn't know who he was. A prime example of two guys meeting for the first time on a large scale pay-per-view and tearing the house down. Speaking of prime, WrestleMania 39 was against Logan Paul, with the basis behind it being that Seth was the gatekeeper for the boys in the back, that he was representing the business and wouldn't let an outsider walk in and take away what he loved. He wouldn't let someone like that get the opportunities that he believed he did not deserve. I sound like a broken record, but again, the match was very strong. There was a good pace and chemistry between Paul and Rollins, and that brings us to now. Heading into WrestleMania 40, things were supposed to be different. When CM Punk returned, it was basically a done deal that it was going to be Rollins and Punk for the World Heavyweight Championship main eventing night one of WrestleMania. That without a doubt could have possibly been the best build to a Rollins match to date. We saw the bad blood that came out when these two met, and without a doubt, more bad blood would have came out, but because of Punk's injury, that's not happening. Instead, Seth Rollins is going to be wrestling twice at this event. First, he's finally going to be in a main event as he teams up with Cody Rhodes to take on Roman Reigns and The Rock. And the next night, we'll defend the World Heavyweight Championship against Drew McIntyre in what could potentially be another entry into an already deep resume. Actually, two cracks at adding more into the resume. A while back, I made a video talking about Mr. SummerSlam, and the key person who stuck out to me was Brock Lesnar, and for good reason. I think Mr. SummerSlam is Brock Lesnar, but the thing was, adjusting for eras, I could find more comparables, one of which was Rollins. But when it comes to Mr. WrestleMania in the modern age, there really aren't that many comparables. Roman has had too many duds and too much of a mess attached to his name, Kevin Owens has been consistent, and then everyone else has been here, there, and everywhere in between. Moving forward, a big match that everyone wants to see is Roman and Seth, and that's a match that sells itself without titles, so that could potentially be a retirement match one day. Who knows, depending on where the chips fall, if we end up getting the Shield triple threat match, but all that aside, I think it's pretty safe to say that Seth Rollins in the modern era is Mr. WrestleMania. He's had a great catalog of matches, he's had good stories, and he's yet to miss at that event. In the comments below, let me know your favorite Seth Rollins WrestleMania match. I'll catch you guys real soon.